mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our appointed psalm for us is Psalm 81 verses 1 to 10. We shall speak it responsibly full verse by whole verse. Psalm 81 verses 1 to 10. Bow down to a foreign God. I am 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Eternal God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is our true sacrifice. Help us to keep each day holy by receiving his word of comfort, that we may find our rest in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one of God, now and forever. Amen. Oh, 
the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now in your bulletins, the reading stops thus, but there is more reading for this Sunday. Continuing in chapter 3. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus as to how to destroy him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Nicene. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was a man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, Proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke.
today we have um, a focus on this word Sabbath. And so my sermon is titled, Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, in the book of Genesis, it describes that God created all things in six days, and man, the epitome of his creation on that penultimate day. You will note that it is six days, not six periods or six intervals, but six days, evening and morning, the biblical day. And then, on the seventh day, God rested. See, I asked one of our confirmants, a young little child, and I asked him this question only last uh, week, not really realizing that this is going to be uh, the reading. I asked him, so do you think God needed to rest? And he, he actually got it. He said, no, not really. I don't think so God needs to rest. You see, I'm always impressed at how quickly and how wonderfully little children get these things. And so then I asked him the next question. Well then, why did the Lord create the seventh day of rest? He said, for us. <coughs> that is true. He created the seventh day of rest for us. See, the entire world all over is ordered to a week of seven days with a holiday or a holy day of rest for them. And so the Lord Jesus again emphasized the Sabbath was created for man and not man for the Sabbath. And it is wonderful that God has actually invited us all into his rest. And this invitation is more than that. It is not just rest from your labors but it is also time to reflect on His Word. Above all, that before you leave here, you get the central idea of the Sabbath rest, which is to receive His forgiveness in order to strengthen our faith in Him. We will all come back to that again. But of course, there are a lot of people who have a very myopic view of leisure or break. Almost all of us can set away time to get away from the mundane activities, routine of work. Some of them can make it as entertainment, some can look at it as hiking or biking or some other vacation. Of course, in their own right, all of us need a holiday. All of us need a time away from our regular routine. And that is good for you. But we have to wonder if in our current culture of excess in our sleepness that we have grown to if we have taken it too far and let the wise discern it for themselves. You see in the Gospel of St. Luke in the 10th chapter our Lord commends Mary and not hard-working Martha. See Martha was busy trying to get a meal to trying to look after all the guests in the house who had walked in because the Lord himself was there. But Mary doesn't do any help. The Lord should have actually rebuked her and said, well, why don't you go and assist your sister? But the Lord commends Mary. Why do you think that is? See, Mary understood what the greater part of the service was. She knew that this was the moment that the teaching and the preaching of the Word Himself, now a house guest, was going to come to her. So Mary delighted in the fact that Jesus was in her own living room. And nothing could prize her from the feet of the Lord. Because she knew that He alone could guide her into the way of truth. That He alone could talk about this work of creation and redemption that would soon become evident as soon as Jesus opened his mouth. And so she never left the Lord's side. And the Lord recognized it and commended it. See, in the Old Testament, again, God set aside that seventh day as a day of rest for his people to worship, to ponder over the goodness, the power of God in the work of creation. The Lord coming, as the writer of Hebrews reminds us, he says, 
in these last days he has spoken to us by his son and so we get even in the gospel account from mark the continuing word of creation and also redemption the man with the withered hand is granted healing by jesus he continued to work bringing deliverance not only from sickness but also from a poor understanding of the sabbath he brings deliverance and healing, life and movement to a palsy dead hand. Imagine if you were forced to use just the one hand, everything would be tougher. I'm not sure if they had snap on buttons or even velcro. You know, try putting on your laces, that would have been a task too. But the Lord recognizes not just this need of physical healing, but also the need for a healing and a need for the forgiveness of sins. You see, healing in the in the New Testament is always a lesser miracle. It is still a miracle, we are not denying that, but it is a lesser miracle. The greater miracle is that the Lord invigorates faith towards him. Faith toward the capital R Redeemer of the world. That is the greater miracle. And in Jesus, on the Sabbath day, he shows how it is going to come together. He says the Sabbath was made for man and not the other way around. See, in the Old Testament, the Sabbath had very peculiar features. The Pharisees had taken it too far. They said if you travel more than 2,560 steps, you've broken the Sabbath. Or if your donkey was to fall into the well, you don't lift the donkey out of the well. But in the Old Testament, as it's clearly given in God's Word, it says, first it is a time for physical rest. Because you have labored thus far, this six days, and now we in the West have been, well, spoiled. So you have two weekends. The Saturday and the Sunday. The next reason in the Old Testament is that it is a time of spiritual rest through fellowship, through devotion, to ponder over God's promises and His Word, to ponder over the promises of the Lord's saving deeds, and it is written that days and, and seasons of worship are memorialized, Sabbath being one of them. But lastly, it is not just these things, but also to ponder over the eternal provisions that God has given for this life and the next. And yes, we are all kind of in this uh, rat race, especially in the West, yes, everywhere now. We are in this rat race to somehow get more, to earn more, uh, to have great retirement, all of that. And those are good things to work for, but not at the cost of pondering over God's Word. See, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus commends us to learn from the birds of the heavens. He says, look at the birds, and neither sow nor they reap, and yet your Father in heaven cares much more. How much more will he care for you? And so we kind of sometimes take away this idea of God's provision that he's giving to all, not just to us who are good, but also to all the evil. God cares for us when He raises up saints. Just as He raised up the venerable Luther, who explains in the small catechism that we should remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. And then He says, what does this mean? He says, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and His word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. So, the question goes, how do we fear and love God through this third commandment? The answer is pretty simple. We fear and love God by not despising or neglecting His Word. Well, that raises another question. Well, how do we despise and neglect God's Word? Well, one way is failing to gather for worship, for receiving God's Word and His holy sacraments. In Hebrews 10, he says, Do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some encourage one another. All the more when you see the day 
drawing here. And then you see outside, you do understand that we are in the end times. Oh, you, the wise in the world, don't you look at the sky and see that it is going to rain? Or look at the sky and know it's going to be a hot day? Why would you not be able to discern the times are towards an end? Again, in Luke 10, the Lord says, the one who hears you, hears me. The one who rejects you, rejects me. The one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So there is a portion of our actions of how we should gather together, but there is also this idea of inaction, of not <coughs> pondering on God's word, of rejecting, of despising His word. Thanks be to God that we have been granted faith, that we have been called to fear and love God by taking time to reflect on God's word. In treasuring God's word as sacred, or as the Psalter says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a guide to my path. I will let your word dwell in me richly, as Colossians says. It's not just reflecting, but devoting. It means being faithful. It means having fidelity. It even has a certain sense of staunchness in participating in both public and private devotion. See, now as to the significance of this Sabbath. We are told no longer to celebrate the Sabbath. In that sense, we are no longer under judgment on matters of eating, so we can eat anything. We are not in judgment over matters of drinking, not that we become drunks. Definitely we are not under judgment on matters of the Sabbath, as St. Paul explains. But I want you to take, if anything back, this back, about what does the Sabbath mean for us today. Yes, the Sabbath is physical rest, but that you come to this realization that all the laws of God, which are righteous and good for us, Jesus came to fulfill. In Jesus, you have rest. And especially in the third commandment, that you have rest from this impossible task of seeking security, of seeking righteousness, of seeking your salvation through your own efforts. So Jesus urges you just as he urged the disciples, just before the miracle of feeding of the 5,000. He says, come away to a desolate place and rest a while. And so that is why Jesus invites you to come to church, where he still serves you with his word and his sacraments. For as many as who have entered this rest have rested from their works, just as God himself has rested from his. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was a sign pointing to the Master, even Jesus our Lord. The only one who is able to give us the greater Sabbath, a spiritual rest from the burden of sins. See again, as we go back to that miracle on the Sabbath day, God did not rest in the way we think of it. The little man got it quite easily. He understood God is not a God who stops listening to us. He's not a God who's gone on a vacation and just doesn't bother us. No, we see the Lord Jesus healing on the Sabbath. But the Sabbath is that we understand Jesus now wishes us all also to rest from our labors. To put an end to all these strivings of how we are going to work out our righteousness rather than leaning on Jesus, receiving His righteousness, receiving the salvation for which He has birthed. To be engaged with His word, to carry it in our hearts, upon our lips, because it is only God's word that sanctifies everything. The last Sunday we were hearing about these burning embers that cleanse the man of unclean lips took away his iniquity. Now, the Sabbath of the Lord comes to you in word and sacraments. 
Once the elements have been combined to the word, it is a life-giving medicine. It is the medicine of immortality. From your ears it is heard, from the lips it is taken in, from the lips to the heart, from the heart to the life, sanctifying you, body and soul. It's no longer these burning embers, but humility in the elements of the bread and the wine, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, to be in the house, Lords, is indeed a privilege for us as Christians. Never for one moment forget that there are so many of our brothers and sisters who share the faith in, in the world out there who cannot even openly come for worship. Indeed, it is a privilege for us as Christians to be able to gather without fear, to gladly hear God's word, to set aside a day to worship. See, the Lord's Catechism teaches, whenever God's Word is taught, whenever God's Word is preached, whenever it is read, whenever it is meditated upon, then the person, the day, and even His Word are sanctified. This is not because of the outward Word, but because of the Word which makes the saints of us all. So the force and the power of this commandment lies not that we rest, but that we are sanctified. So coming to church is this holy exercise and it belongs to this day. A work is done to us by the Lord where He makes us a holy people. And all of this is done only through God's Word. In the holy name of Jesus, let us pray. We thank you, kind Father, that you give us time to hear your holy word. Grant that fearing and loving you, we may set aside our work to receive your Son's word, which are spirit and life. And so refreshed and renewed by the preaching of your gospel, we might live in the peace and quietness that come through faith alone. We ask it for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all the faithful and just people gathered here, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to yourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors and those who hold office in your church. Especially do we remember Timothy, our president, Marvin, our regional pastor, and also myself as circuit counselor, that by our devoted service, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy, Send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to advance the gospel both at home and in distant lands. We especially thank you for Daniel, for Aaron, for Albert, and for Vijay. Those who have you, those whom you have called into holy service. Lord, grant to them ever increasing gladness in the days of service ahead of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead peaceable lives with integrity. 
grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially Charles, our King, Mary, our Governor General, Justin, our Prime Minister, and the Parliament, the government of this province, and all those who have authority over us, that they may uphold your eternal laws and repent of all that they have done wrong. Help them to serve this people accordingly to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sanctify our homes with your presence. Bless them with joy. Keep the children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and all the world. Grant also, Lord, to all those who come to receive from your hand forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation in the true body and blood given on this altar. Bring consolation to those in sorrow. Grant to all a measure of your love, especially remembering all those for whom prayers have been sought. Colin, Linda, Patrick, Rosie, Jordan and Jose, Ivan and Uta, Nuru, Julia, Nathan, Robert and Helen, Marilyn and family, Elfie, Ashka, Liz, Her, Julie, Annie, Renata, Les, Lynn, Joanne, Bruce, Lorna, Colleen, Emma, Itana, Renata, Jack and Shirley, Mitch, Pastor James, Luke, Ben Smother, Lee and Aunt Alice, Sonia, Ruth, David, Gail, Rose, Fraser, Bev, Anupam, Pastor Bars, Renee, Kim, and all those we name now in the silence of our hearts. that you would uphold them in truth, that they may not be shaken, and that they would be gladdened in their hearts, causing their tongues to rejoice and make them dwell, their flesh dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. all these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
up in your heart. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And we will try to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in our creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we lord and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy summer of your son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout the days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.